Welcome everybody who's just joined us and, and welcome Pradeep Singh for our uh, for the last talk of this term in our series in the professional world. For those of you who haven't joined us uh, previously, sort of the idea is to sort of talk to folks who are professionals in many different aspects and sort of to destabilize this notion of what a professional is and to look at people who are doing phenomenal things in perhaps less orthodox fields. And today with us, we have a very special guest all the way from Tramsa, we have Pradeep Singh Nagar, who's an athlete, humanitarian, historian, and social activist who's been, who has a fantastic and very inspiring life story that, and, and I'm really excited to be able to talk to him today. Uh, and just sort of a few housekeeping rules I've had today is going to go. Um, so we will be going until about three o'clock and essentially I'll be talking with Pradeep Singh for about half an hour and then afterwards we'll open the floor up for questions. But if you have any that kind of come up for our talk, just please feel free to pop them in the chat and we'll try and adjust them as soon as possible. Uh, otherwise, I just want to let everyone know as well that this event's being recorded. So if you're uncomfortable having your face on camera, you are more than welcome to turn it off. Um, but without further ado, Pradeepaji, welcome. Um, it's a pleasure having you. And um, I just want to sort of uh, jump straight in to start talking about boxing. Uh, one of the things you're probably most known for is that you, know, you challenged the Canadian Boxing uh, Association because uh, you weren't allowed to fight because of your case. And um, so my initial question is, sort of what drew you to box in the first place? What was, what was the sort of motivation behind that? Well, it's interesting. I always grew up as an athlete. Um, so, so competition was never far away from me. Um, and I was open to, to, to learning and trying any sport, really, um, just, just growing up as, as a young kid. Soccer was obviously my first love. Um, I did a lot of track. I ended up uh, wrestling in high school, Olympic style wrestling. Uh, I was on the badminton team, uh, won a tennis championship, um, you know, and so, so if there's any, it was, if there was any excuse to get involved in sports, uh, I did it. And, and it was, you know, on, on one part kind of recreational, but another part very competitive uh, in the sense that I would try to excel as, as much as I can. Um, the long and short of it was that uh, I, I got injured playing uh, soccer, uh, football. Uh, and, um, and I, I, I hurt my shoulder and, uh, in trying to recover from the injury, I actually needed surgery. And at the same time of when I was going in for surgery, um, I had joined the local police force as an auxiliary constable, and that was mandatory training. And so when I went for the surgery, um, I didn't get time for rehab because I was still in the training, uh, because if I couldn't continue. I would have had to come back the year later because because you had to kind of just run it through. And so I, I walked into uh, a boxing gym um, to heal an injury. And, <laughs> and people would think, well, you know, that's kind of crazy. First of all, a boxing gym and, and, and you have an injury, which can, isn't boxing going to cause more injury, so to speak. Right. But uh, and, and, and what was interesting was, you know, in growing up, there's always two physiques I always want to emulate uh, as an athlete. Uh, either a boxer's physique um, or a gymnast. You know, growing up watching the Olympics and 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 uh, male gymnasts, right, uh, right across the world, and and the flexibility, the strength, and what they can actually do, and and just just their physique was just phenomenal. And um, so I always had this kind of draw, and and, and uh, naturally boxing uh, in the heydays of just as as Ali was was uh, ending his career. And so, so I walk into the boxing gym and you would think, what, what is it there? But what, what, what attracted me to, to the boxing gym to actually heal from an injury was that the core training of boxing, for example, the speed bag, right? All works on the shoulders, right? That's all about shoulder strength and arm strength and stuff like that. And so a lot of the core exercises itself, separate from the sport, uh, was going to help me develop and strengthen back some core muscles and shoulder muscles and stuff to, towards my recovery. Now, naturally, you know, when you go out and hang out in a gym uh, regularly, a boxing gym, and you're doing some of the core training and other people are in there, you know, punching the bags hard, doing some pad work, sparring, you, you know, you always have this little twitch in you to say, you know, I would love to get in the ring one day and test myself out, you know, why not, mm -hmm. right? And so what had happened was, um, anyway, so, so that's, 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 what, that's what got me into boxing, uh, just to answer the question. 
Okay, it's not fantastic. And yeah, and a lot of boxing as well is, is, is about sort of strength, not just physically, but also sort of mental toughness as well. Uh, so sort of for you and, and sort of when you were dealing with things both in and out of the ring, what was, where would you draw your strength from? Well, you know, it's interesting because uh, if we talk about the concept of strength or, or even that moment of standing up, because the cases have probably presented themselves before and I couldn't step away because if I stepped away from that challenge when it was brought to my attention, uh, that means I was going to ask somebody else to take on a so-called fight or battle that I was responsible for. So why would I put that onus on somebody else to, to fight a battle that I should equally be responsible for? And, you know, the strength, know the strength. came from um, the faith, the community, right? Um, I, I, I grew up engaged in the community. Uh, my parents did a lot of community service. And through oral history and stuff, they shared a lot of the uh, ethos and, and, and folk stories of our faith. And, and they're critical ones, because, uh, you know, in the intro, you talked about issues of social justice and what have you. And so, you know, I, I, I became active in just like how you guys are engaging in the Sikhs Association here. Um, back in my university days in, in, in the 80s, uh, I was involved with, with, with the uh, student organizations. I was involved in the community. Um, community work is, was important. Um, and at that time, I had just started my professional career in public health, and I was doing community development. And, and, so, and so issues of social justice, issues of injustice, in, issues of marginalization, all those aspects uh, were, were, it, were I, I was open and visible to them because of the faith, right? And, and so, and so that, that was a key part of my strength uh, in terms of stepping up to the challenge that was presented. And, and sometimes, you know, I would also want to point out, it's not even it's not stepping even up to a challenge that presents us. That, that should be, relatively speaking, the obvious. It's what's our capacity to step up for a challenge that has nothing to do with us and put ourselves out there, just like our gurus had done throughout history. And, and, and so, so that, that's where a lot of that strength and, and, and inspiration came. And I'm not sure if you're gonna ask a question, but I'll tell you a really interesting story about it all at, at, at when it was in its peak, uh, the whole boxing issue. Um, there, was, there was a clause they were trying to use to, to, to not allow me to compete at the national championships, which, which was going on for the Sydney Olympic qualification in 1999 for the 2000 Sydney Olympics. And we ended up finding that England had, a, had an exemption for Sikhs at that time. So in 1999, Bo bo uh, 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 boxing England or England Boxing, whatever the association's na official name was, had an exemption for sick boxers. And so we use that, we use that as a challenge saying, there's no reason why I can't because if the Canadian Amateur Boxing Association was scared to, to uh, uh, not have membership with the International Amateur Boxing Association, they're gonna lose their membership if they went this route. We said, uh, boxing England is already in good standing and they have this exemption, right? And, and we're not just looking for an exemption for Sikhs, we're just looking for a wider open exemption. Uh, long and short story of that, that exemption actually got taken away uh, a number of years later in England. And in fact, I was fighting for the last 12 years to get that back in and we're successful about three years ago. So it was interesting that there's that little narrative as well uh, related to the whole boxing issue. No, definitely. And that's kind of something I'm going to touch on later. It's, it's almost sort of like sort of 15, 20 years onwards. It's almost the same battle. On a, on a, yes. You know, just in a different place. And I guess my question to you about that, sort of, did, did you see much difference over that time period in terms of what you had fought for compared to then what was happening in England? Yeah, so, yeah. so you know, and, and I get that question a lot just because, and I, again, I'm not sure if you're going to get into it, the, the Hollywood movie that was made about my boxing story and stuff. And, and so I do a lot of public speaking. And one of the number one questions I always get, people say, Pardeep, is it better or worse? Right? And, and I said, you know, truth be told, uh, if, if you're now talking literally 20, almost 22 years since that boxing initiative, and you're to really ask me how much change we made, I would say it's less than incremental. It's less than incremental. So first of all, um, the pace for change is, is, is not good enough, point blank. The other part is we have this new medium 
which is one of the most dangerous things that has been presented to us, the social media. And every single research study has shown that, that hate, bigotry, and racism travels further, farther, deeper, and faster in that world. And that's a world that literally almost everybody's connected to. And so, and so somebody, somebody sitting in the room who, for lack of a better word, hated that this so-called Sikh boxer, which I was defining as a Canadian boxer who is Sikh, and whatever they're feeling in their head, that's all that's there. And if they have enough energy to remember next time they see friends on Monday at school or going to meet up with friends, they might discuss it. Today, I can be a single person in this world watching that YouTube video or watching an interview or seeing, seeing my stuff on the news. And I can go, I don't even, I can be anywhere. I don't even have to be sitting on front of a computer on, on my phone saying, and the racist epaulets attach, you know, these packages, and what are they trying to do? They're training, training rules and stuff like that. And they can get that spread. A single person with that mindset now can spread and they do spread and they are spreading, right? And, 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 and if you really still look at the resistance we're facing right around the world on, on diversity and inclusive uh, issues, systems, organizations, institutions. We just talked briefly before the start of this about, you know, Cambridge, uh, and 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 now the, the sick population seems to be kind of kind of ramping up and doubling. But you're wondering where where was it before, right? Um, that there's no institution today in 2021 that can say they they got it. They're immune to this stuff. The real question is, are what are you prepared to do about it? Right. And that's the question we must be asking. And so so it would be naive for me to say that things are technically better. My nieces, my nephews now all starting to work professionally now are fundamentally starting to, to understand these critical issues that I've worked my whole life on. now, Right. Because sometimes uh, we can be isolated from them because if we just grew up in a neighborhood, going to school, playing sports and stuff like that, uh, it, it doesn't impact us systemically yet. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm not denied something, money, opportunity, access, networking, and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's when you start finding out a little bit older, as you get older, how those things impact you, right? So it'll be hard to really share 15, 16 year olds. We can talk to them about curriculum. How, how was your curriculum engaged? How inclusive was it? Did you ever see stories about you? Because still in today, I work for the school board full time. So in 2021, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to students at Cambridge, telling them that the largest school board in Canada's curriculum is still not inclusive enough, right? And, and, and so does it reflect stories of people who look like me and defining our nation building and history as part of Canada from over 100 years ago, right? And so, and so those are my real test pieces. I know people can say, well, part of, you know, some of us are here and look what we have and we have members of parliament, or we have city councillors, or we have professionals, uh, we have CEOs. Oh, we're still picking those off. We're still picking those off in our hands because, because the real systemic issues are the ones that we really have to be able to address going forward. No, definitely. And, and, and especially sort of the way that like social media is wrapping things up. Um, and and uh, it sort of, it is, it is ask an interesting question actually. Uh, so what was the sort of reception like at the time, both within Sikh communities and outside, when you were fighting those legal battles? And do you feel that like that would be a different in them today? Yeah, so, yeah. so um, uh, a lot of things, again, even in Canada, remind me that it's not different, right? Um, uh, that there will still be people, if you're asking about that beard issue in boxing, why do these people come? Why do you want to change your rules? The, the rhetoric is still there, those people, the othering. Um, and in the community, you know, it was, uh, and, and, and it was intense, uh, like, you know, I don't have enough time to get into in, the, in, in a half an hour, they're going to have just around the boxing piece, but it wasn't an easy time because I was representing Ontario, the province of Ontario at a national championship. So you would think the Ontario team would rally around me because I'm one of them. Right. But I didn't get that support and stuff. And so there was a lot of places systemically within the boxing and then just the constant resistance. Cause I, cause, cause what ended up happening was. I, I fought the battle already, so to speak, outside of the boxing ring to start to compete. And I became the provincial novice champion. I, I became the provincial representative at the national championships. 
And then they denied me at weigh-in and we, it was a really interesting legal aspect of it. Like, like, uh, you know, in of itself can be the story, a story in of itself, but we ended up being in court during the time for weigh-ins as I got disqualified from weigh-ins and we got a judge to hear the case on the spot, which is almost unheard of in any court case. You can go to the courts in England. They already have their day set up, their docket, right? Their capacity or flexibility to have uh, bring in a case on that day. And, and, you know, this is not a first world problem per se case that, you know, it's such an emergency, but it was a relative emergency nature to what we're trying to do. So a judge was prepared to take it. They took it on. The judge is willing to hear the case without the other side present because they were all out there. And then the judge ended up rendering a, dis, uh, uh, a temporary injunction to allow me to compete there. And we faxed it over and stuff. Right. And then even after that decision, then they end, end up canceling the whole weight class. Okay, and stuff. And it just intense after intense. So, so that's kind of stuff of how that's being received in the community. Uh, and this is, I, you know, I still love sharing some of these stories because, you know, it, it's uh, I, I, whether I'm at a good water or anywhere, you know, and I was a public figure even before that boxing thing because I was heavily involved in the community. And I was like, huh, Pradeep, what the kid done? because uh, because that's how we still speak to the sport of boxing because it's you know right so they never used the term boxing barely any anyone in the community ever came up and said that boxing could the jelly right they always said said wrestling or goal and stuff like that right so it was always cute um and but but again similar to hopefully we're going to get into this discussion we technically failed as a community then and we're still failing as a community now because what we haven't been able to do is create a, a, an institution that can respond to our community needs at any given time. And, and, and if, I, if, if anybody ever has a chance, and I'm gonna invite all of you to come out to Toronto and visit the Heritage Museum, uh, I'll, you know, the, sh the stories of the early settlers and pioneers and how they mobilized. And in fact, while they knew that they were going about to make their barely living, they knew there were a lot of critical issues in the community that had to be dealt with. We were disenfranchised in 1907. We didn't have access to employment. There were a whole bunch of critical issues. What did they do? They, they sought out the uh, most highly educated and resourceful Sikhs in the world. And so Professor Teja Singh and Dr. Sundar Singh and stuff, they brought them here. And they said, you know, we will go on to our day-to-day -day activities, but we will take care of your hospitality, food, industry, income and everything, but we need work done for us while we're at work every day, right? And so they knew and, and, and uh, that community, while we're at work, our community issues still need to be addressed. They, they can't be addressed at five o'clock when I'm off work, between five and nine, if I have some time, between my personal, my family and all the rest of that stuff. And we are not doing that today. And yet we have access to everything. And the reason I'm saying that is because I had said that time, let's create a community 5K fund. Because because this is not going to be the first time our articles of faith have been challenged. They have been before, and it won't be the last. Because there's going to be, as we continue to engage, and someone goes into Taekwondo, National World Championships, Karate, or whatever it may be, another sport, basketball and stuff, whatever it may be, you're going to find these little challenges at workplace, employment, wherever it may be. And we need to always be ready as a community. Not that's going to be the time where we're going to try to mobilize. Okay, which who who are lawyers in our community? Who can we get to get this? Who's in the media? Let's let's quickly email a few people, mobilize a few people, and see what we can do on this issue. And and we weren't able to do that that time, and we're still struggling to try to do that right now. And that's the difference of what the U.S. has been able to do because when the Sikh Coalition, Saldiv and all them, when especially the Sikh Coalition, when they came and consulted with me before they were going to initiate themselves, I said. One of the failures we still have in Canada and, and in England, although we're more progressive in some areas, was that we hadn't been able to institutionalize these types of, of, of organizations in our community. And so I want you to use an institutional model to go forward. Otherwise, you're still going to be in today of Canada, some critical issue comes by. We have a World Sick Organization that does it in part, but we're still ad hoc, right? And 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 so and so. You know, that's the part I care most about is, is where we are systemically as a community. Uh, I get that great pat on the back on the shoulder here and there, but that's not going to do it because what what's I, I was able to still financially because I was working professionally top up money to fight the legal case. What happens if there's a young person who doesn't have the financial means or the family doesn't have the financial means?
right? We as a community can't sit back when we have access to everything, including financial, and saying, no, that, that, that's going to be a barrier for us to, 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 to assert uh, our, our rights wherever we are around the world. No, definitely. And, and so, then, so then what do you feel, what do you feel another step is taking then to sort of engage in that sort of advocacy? So what, what does it take from the community? Well, you know, what, what it's going to take is going to be a shift in the mindset. And that's why, for me, I can't speak enough of how much of an honor it is to speak to all of you, because I always say that you are going to be the ones not only defining our community, but you guys are going to be defining, if, if most of you decide to stay in London, your country, right? And it's a shift in the mindset, because I, 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 will, I will share this interesting metaphor that I use. In, in, in this early 70s and 80s, as, as a community of Toronto, because uh, in Canada, we're over 100 years, but mostly on the Pacific Coast and stuff, but Toronto, mostly in the 60s and 70s, the, the, the second wave of migration had come. And, and when individuals from the community came and knocked on our door and they said to, to my parents, you know, because we moved up from the downtown core um, into the suburbs a little bit, Malton, Missaga, a lot of people know Brampton and all these areas here. And they're going to be opening up good to us. They came and knocked on the door and they said, hey, uh, we're, we're going to be opening good to And dad just went and pulled out either a check or cash in those days you used to carry cash all the time stuff and gave what he could. And then all said, you know, anything else, just let me know. And the reason, and that's all that was said, period. And the reason was, cause their mindset was this. Cause I sometimes used to hear the conversation in the front door. You know, 24 seven, a place, why not create our institution? We need it. Right? Because you know, there, somebody passes away, somebody's getting married. These institutions are going to sustain themselves. You can hate, I can, you can have your politics around any good to they're still going to exist and they're going to outlive us and they're going to serve the community needs because whether you like good or not, your friend might get married at that one and you're going to attend the wedding. Right? So they're just going to serve those community functions. The difference today is we ask more questions than anything we're willing to give. When are you going to open it? How big is it? Who's going to serve on the committee? What are you looking to do? And, and everybody has ideas, but no one is going to give us the funding. Right? And why? It's because our mind shift has shifted right now, where our parents were willing to do with what they have. You gave my dad and me $10,000 to go and get a car from a parking lot. And there's two cars that are identical. And one is priced at 10 and one is priced at 11. And dad will come home with the $10,000 one and say, and I said, what are you talking about, right? Did you pay for it? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But there was one for 11. I got this for 10, man. Same car, right? And he's laughing. I go and I come back with the 11. And I asked two friends for 500, 500 bucks each, right? Because I only got 10. I was given 10 to go and get a car. And I come back with 11 and dad can't figure it out. He goes, what the hell did you just do? And I said, because the, the $10,000 one was purple, right? And, and the $11,000 one was black, right? And I didn't want to drive a purple car, right? I want to drive a black car. And dad goes, $1,000 for paint color? You went to go and get paint color or you went to go and get a car, right? And he goes, damn, I can go to a local here. We got Canadian Tire, get a paint shop, spray paint your car for like 50 bucks. I'll paint it black, right? You're paying $1,000 for color. And what dad doesn't know is people like us, all of us, this is how we're making choices. I would have paid eleven five if it had some nice rims on it. I would have paid 12000 if it had a great stereo system in it. But what did I go to get? A car. And so you see where our mind is thinking. And then once I pay twelve, and you come to me and say, hey, party, Sikh Student Association of Cambridge is looking to just raise some funds because we want to have financial stability for us and future going forward always and to do programming. We need money. And I'll say, Arjun, man, sorry, man. I'm tight, man. I, I, just, I just got a car. A car is preventing our community and the Cambridge Six Student Associations from going forward because Pradeep doesn't have money and everybody else is thinking like Pradeep doesn't have money because that's how we're making choices. Like I'm asking people, my friends, if they're buying a $60,000 car today, I say, can you choose a $55,000 car today? I'm not asking you to choose a 20,000 because you can still get great cars for 25, 30,000 brand new off the parking lot, right? But instead of 60, choose 55 and put $5,000 towards charity. 
based on that decision you made to get a car. I'm still not asking them to go down, right? If you're gonna buy a house, do you, do you take your tax slip, go to the mortgage and say, what do I qualify for? And when they say, well, you qualify for, for let's say a, a, a 700,000 pound house, you're, that's the starting point where people start looking. And they say, if I got to borrow off my parents or this and that, take an extra loan, we'll figure it out. Even if I have to go seven, five. And then when we're looking for, 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 for the community, for us to engage, you're saying, oh no, man, I'm financially strained, right? When I'm going, our parents lived in less houses. And so instead of a, a 700,000 pound house, why don't you go for a 650,000 pound house? Or why don't you actually take your bank slips and saying, you know what? Because now I'm going to introduce two important concepts in our community because we like to brag about them, but our practicalness of really doing them are two different stories, Seva and Daswant. We've turned the concept of Seva in terms of what we do at the Gudwara or when there's a Nangri Kirtan and we got t-shirts that say Seva Dal. That's, that's in complete, the complete 180 opposite of what the concept of Seva is. If you come to a house and I host you and I wash the dishes or I feed you, I'm not doing Seva. Uh, that's our Fudge, it's my house, um, I'm hosting you. Every single good to institution is our house of God, our house of God. Anybody that comes in, whether it's from our own community or the greater community, we're hosting them. That's not Seva. Seva is what happens for the wider community outside the walls. That's one, that's one just from the financial perspective. Forget the other aspect of giving up your time, energy, and all that, which is important. I know around here locally in Canadian dollars, most households are easily making $100,000. I'm, I'm, I, I make over six figures working for, for the school board. My, my salary is on the uh, public because I work for a public institution. I have a friend who's a superintendent making 140. His wife's a teacher making 90. So they're making 230. If I default them to 100,000, saying that's fine, whatever you make, but I'm just going to keep you at 100,000, your dust one is 10,000. We're looking for a tenth of a tenth for the museum. And there's, it's charitable status, and people can actually still get a tax benefit from it. So we'll net you $600 of what it's gonna cost you, but you can sustain institutions. We're struggling. Yet look at the level of income. I'm just talking about them. And I'm not talking about the high, high income earners that we have tons of who don't even say, forget you guys, man. We can just plot money from our, what we already have. And you guys just do the good stuff. That's our problem is because we are not sitting as families at the beginning of January 1st and saying, what does our dust one look like as a family right now? When, you, when all of you are gonna get your first uh, income jobs, and even if you're working right now, are you taking dust one out of it? When I go to the bank to get a mortgage, do I tell them to reduce my, my qualification by 10% because every year I have to have 10% that I wanna give to dust one? Is that how I'm going to get a mortgage for my house? And if not, then you know the trouble we're gonna be in. <laughs> right? And you know where our mindset is because then our mindset is what we call that staircase. And the staircase is the I, 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 and I need to get ahead. And when I'm good or I'm fine, I will think about it. And we can't think about community needs that are needed in 2021 and think I'm going to address them 10 years later. As we move along and we have access to everything, the spirit of Sikhi was that you're always going to have enough. You're always going to have enough. You have enough time in the day, 24 hours, to give up your time as well. Right. And, and the gurus never stipulated at what threshold income should you have when you start giving this one. This one was 10, 10%, period. And so, so those are the most critical issues that if there's anything that's going to be the takeaway that you start having these conversations amongst your peers, your family, your friends to shift that narrative in the community. Because I mentioned to you earlier that I come out to England quite a lot for a number of different personal and professional uh, reasons and stuff. And there's resources like this that you guys have in your backyard, right? Individuals put on world-class leading exhibitions at the Brunei Gallery, they've done three now, free. I fly out from Canada to pay a ticket to get there. And I remember going through the exhibit and people have come there for free and I said, and I said can you do one thing? Just pick up one book when you're leaving. Because I said, it cost me more to ship that book to Canada than what you're going to pay for it here. And people struggle to buy it. And this is somebody that spent millions of dollars of the time, energy, and resources. Just think of whatever minimum wage in England might be. When I'm selling a book in Canada that's $40 Canadian on the Komagata Maru, 
minimum wage is $15 here. That's three hours of minimum wage. And somebody has spent years of their work. They spent hours cleaning up pictures. They spent hours driving to Ottawa, four hours away to do some research in the archives, national archives, and drive back four hours plus hotel and everything else. And they've wrapped it up for $40 Canadian. And people, when they come to the museum, still struggle to spend $40 on that book. And I can't put a, a, a gimmick on that mint. It's priceless to me. And our generation has been creating these resources and we're still struggling to even get them. And so, and so if that's where we're mentally and in action really sitting as a community, then we can't be going around even in Canada saying we have Jigmeet, we have the defense minister, we have the veins, we have the Nav Bhatia as the Raptor guy, we have Rupi Kaur and stuff and all relative great stuff. But at its core, you, you see where we're, we're, where we're systemically dysfunctional because we haven't been able to create institutions. And a lot of it has been our mindset because there's no shortage, especially our generation. Our parents had done enough. If I ask literally my generation, my friends, I would literally say like we say in Punjabi, is it kakni kita in, in the truest sense for, for all that we had and we can and we should be doing. And so, and so I, I, I hope that that's gonna be a critical takeaway that, that all of you can shift that narrative in the community because there's no reason not to whatsoever, whatsoever. And, and, and even right now, cause I was gonna mention the UK PHA book club. And it's funny because, because Amandeep always had said, they had said, you know, so, you know, people would get questions, how can we support and donate? And he says, forget donating to UK PHA book club, go on to Kashi House and just buy the ones that we've already done <laughs> to help us even just get back our costs so we can continue to try to produce. Because there's no reason for that. We, the artifacts in those places that I've led artifacts for, we spent thousands of dollars and you get it all there into the greatest resource that's humanistically available for us in the community, right? And and because because I picked up a few here, I have there's uh, Peter Bantz, which uh, is the book on Maharaja Dalip Singh's piece, right? I, 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 uh, we have Warrior Saints, we have Sikhs in Britain. These are just some basic basic starting points for us to have a strong sense of who and what we are. Wherever we are in the diaspora, in Canada, we have uh, um, uh, a book by Sergey Jagpal ca called um, uh, Becoming Canadian Sick Pioneers in Their Own Words and stuff, plus these books and stuff. This is the minimum also that we need to do to, to create knowledge, what I call social capital for us, right? We wouldn't be having the issues we have in France if people were aware and showed them the postcards we have of, of Sikh soldiers carrying the French flag and French people saluting them because we walked into their, their country to protect their country and their constitution that they're using against us. It would never have happened. But because we are not willing to spend the time, we're going to go through, you're going to go through and get your university education. You're going to spend four years. You're going to have spent academically over 20 years of your life. But how much have you even spent a year academically to engage in all the identities of why we're even on this call as part of the Sikh Student Association at Cambridge? What, what have we done to, 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 to nurture, to foster, to embrace, to enhance, and to understand as a community, whose shoulders are we on and what is my part to at minimum, at minimum, maintain that legacy and really, because in the spirit of Sikki, <laughs> raise that. Really, you know, it should be jumping off the shoulders now saying, hey, we get to be on shoulders. We should be up there running over there, right? So, so that's the spirit I want to, I, I, I hope uh, that people can see and feel in that. And, and I say that because, again, usually when I go around and I'm speaking to you guys and I'm not sure if I spoke with Dilmi or whatever, uh, I'm, not, I'm not that young anymore. I'm in my 50s, <laughs> right? And, and realistically, I'm doing this because I see this as a community responsibility because all of you are going to define the community. My, you know, my, my, my son and daughter are, are, are close in age to you guys, right? I got nieces and nephews that are older than all of you, right? But you guys are going to start defining the community. Our, our time has come. Ours is just whatever you can need from me a day like today. Financial resources, I'm game. Coming out to England, you asked, I'll be there. You know, that, that's, that, that's the minimum I can do. But really, the next generation is going to have to take on the mantles and where you can take the community, how you can represent the community, oh, only you know, only you know. And I can't tell you that we have, we have the strongest foundation 
because any of the historical research I did, think about, think about how we were written about, spoken about, and it was based on our actions and deeds. I'm not sure if anybody had ever heard in their houses the stories that, that in Punjab or anywhere in India, if a female was on the train and two men boarded, or there's five men on board and five women, the women never felt safe unless one of the people that ever boarded, and it could even be just be a single male Sikh, that they felt safe. And where did that come from? That was because we were always, our presence had social capital in itself to know that that person you know, and you're gonna have a social expectation that they're gonna serve and protect and fulfill their duty and obligation, right? And so, and so, and so we owe it to ourselves that today when people see us socially, even in our own community, because we know we have our own issues, internalized racism. When they, when they see a, a sick male or female, is that some, somebody they gravitate to or say it's an honor? Like we still have people today from the Middle East, here in Toronto, I went, remember went to a shop, instead of dealing with why I'm watching the shop, the first thing they said, Sadaji, Vaya. And they wanna talk and they thought it was an honor just, just to have the presence of a Sadar in their business, right? And then I ask myself, what am I doing to at minimum sustain that aspect of who we are and in which we should? Because part of our identity was to give a public accountability. I, 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 I speak of another metaphor in policing because people said, is this identity critical? I said, it's, it's the most important piece. Take away this identity and give me a, a hundred people or a million people and I will have to ask each person who and what they represent as their faith if there's no social markers or indicators. Uh, when I worked in the police, if I walked by somebody and there was an assault happening on the street and I walked by the way I'm dressed today, they would have hoped that this person stopped, a community member stopped. But if me, the same party, had my police uniform and walked past them, they would have held me more publicly accountable. Why? Only one thing changed on that party walking past, what I was wearing. And that, and, 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 and that uniform, to them, spoke to them and said that that person wearing that uniform is supposed to serve and protect. Have we nurtured that? Because that's what it was when the gurus had put this on us. And it was, it was, it was a fundamental spirit of to serve and protect. And anybody in society, no matter where you are, that you meet a sick anywhere in the world, you know what you could have expected when you see somebody who publicly gives their affirmation and hold us publicly accountable. That was the beauty of our identity. Like, I love sharing that part. The beauty of having this identity is I can't shy away. And I shouldn't shy away. This is holding me publicly accountable, every ever aspect of it, right? On, on, on women's issues, gender issues, equality, all those aspects, right? So yeah, anyway, I'm having too much fun. Sorry, <laughs> going off on a tangent. No, it's, it was a pleasure, honestly. And, and there's a lot to reflect on there, especially about like how, when we think about sort of the generations that came before us and, and how even though they didn't have the resources that we have today, they had the initiative. And, and, and that led us to have what we had today. <laughs> and when you come from some, I mean, even like within Cambridge recently, we were uncovering stories, and then some dead young saying was in Cambridge in in the early 1900s fighting the same battles about his case, you know that that you know you were fighting in the ring and, and so on and so forth. And we have other sort of you know alumni such as Sadat Kapoor Singh who wrote you know yeah. beautiful beautiful volumes of Sikh history <laughs> and philosophy. You know, it's like it's, it's, right? there's so much out there, right? <laughs> And, yeah. and, and what's phenomenal, because I say this at the Heritage Museum as well, because, because, because there was, there was a time for the Jaita Morcha, and I said, so here we're disenfranchised and all the issues that are going on over here. There's no place we call home because that's British India and we're not acknowledged and recognized here. And yet, and, and you would think, relatively speaking, you know, they're still making, uh, relative to here, not as much, but relative to back home, good coin, right? But that didn't matter for them. Uh, the, the Gather movement, uh, um, the the Jaito Morcha, and all of that. And I tell mm -hmm. and I tell people, you're standing with me in the museum. I go, what pressure do we have on a Saturday right now? We're hanging out, we're hanging out. There's nothing that's so stressed for that's so deep in the community right now that you and I we have to say, forget this conversation. I'm going to meet you all tomorrow. We're flying out somewhere in the world because we're needed, mm -hmm. right? Right. That level of pressure is not even on us, and we still can't figure it out. <laughs> We still can't figure it out, right? So it's interesting. It's interesting. No, definitely. And 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 
Um, reflecting sort of, I want to sort of move on slightly here, even though we could, this is a phenomenon. Like, yeah. Talk about yeah. Uh, I want to talk about some, some other work you've been doing as well in terms of like not only community building work, but with working with, with other sort of social uh, struggles uh, from different communities. I want to talk about especially with Indigenous people in Canada. Uh, for, you know, for us in the UK, so we, we're not necessarily familiar with the entire context, but so I guess maybe you could sort of talk a bit about us about kind of the challenges that Indigenous folk in Canada face, kind of both symbolically and, and materially. Yeah. So if you want to talk about intergenerational trauma, which the, we are starting to use that language within the Sikh community around from partition to 1984 to this farmer protest and stuff and the impact of that. Uh, it's going to take the Indigenous community at least three more generations to even come back to authentically where they should have been as a starting point. And just so just think of what's going to be lost. Uh, one of the worst cultural genocides in the world has been the treatment of in, the indigenous peoples in Canada, in the world. I, I, I have no hesitation or shame as a Canadian speaking to those issues. From, from um, residential schools to the 60s scoop, to our welfare systems and everything else, um, to access today in 2021, uh, clean drinking water, and it was so interesting and so colonial and so white in its, in, its, in its implementation that people might not know another sad chapter of, of how the Indigenous community in Canada has been and in part continues to be treated. And the, the way that the community was moved out into reserves, moved away from the cores of the lands like in Toronto and everywhere else, that actually South Africa thought, what a great concept. And we're going to actually exactly mimic that. And that's what they did to the Blacks for apartheid. Apartheid's foundation was, was from uh, the treatment of Canadian, uh, Canadians to the Indigenous peoples of Canada. And so there's a critical word that we have to understand. So when I speak and when we speak even at the museum, uh, we speak as settlers. We're settlers here in Canada and we, we honor and recognize uh, the indigenous communities that have been caretakers of this land and will continue to be as, as even I'm speaking to all of you today. And, and within that, there's a real personal and societal responsibility around reconciliation. And, and understanding, even for all of us, around a number of different pieces to so-called unlearn. And, and look where, where I have to individually shed myself. Uh, and I was a huge advocate, for example, because of um, we have sports teams, Edmonton Eskimos. We had the Cleveland Indians. Uh, they were coming to Toronto to play baseball. We were challenging that. We don't even want that uh, team to even participate with those jerseys on. Right, so banning these offensive logos because I said you would never, never write Cleveland Jews and have this character of Jewish people or Cleveland Blacks and have this character. So there's no space for those things. Washington Redskins just happened last year, and for years the owner, one of the owners said, as long as I own this team, it will never happen. And and we said yes, the owner will keep mouthing off, and it's up to the corporates that sponsor them because once you stop that funding and he doesn't have a stadium named and, and money coming in and that's exactly st started happening. But again, this is 2022. And if you look at online articles, when I've been advocating for this stuff, it's been over 20 years. Right. And, and so there's so many layers to it, but again, I've never shied away from any aspect of any layer speaking up publicly, uh, addressing individually, collectively within our community, within the greater community. And, there's another form called uh, the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Persons called UNDRIP. And, it, and I want everybody to really familiarize themselves with it um, because, it, because even when you're working for uh, institutions and corporations, they might have offices in other countries and you wanna be able to bring those critical issues up because injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so our capacity as individuals, personally and professionally, and even when working for institutions, we need to be aware of those types of pieces of, of what are some critical issues that are going around um, in, in, in communities. And so 
it's 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 an issue that that I take personally. It's an issue I take as as a Canadian, and it's an issue that I'm uh, uh, an ally with. And thanks for sharing, thanks that. For sharing that. No, definitely. And and just kind of thinking on, especially about kind of then placing sick Canadian history sort of in this conversation as well. Looking at sort of the idea that we're guests, but also kind of like um, you know the, the, the sick pioneers and their role in sort of anti-colonial moves as well. So where, where one thing that kind of stuck out to me was kind of that quote of Johnny McDonald of send me however many Sikhs, right? But then also looking at the atrocities committed, you know, during that period against indigenous people. So then what kind of, what role do we as Sikhs, as people who have been, who are molded in this idea of not only accountability, but also in the fight against tyranny. So what role can we play in indigenous liberation? Yeah, and 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 so, it, so, so I, similar to what I was sharing around the second one, Educate, 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 right? Because because once you get educated, once you get informed, and once you're willing to put the time, energy, and effort towards learning and engagement, and then I'll say experiential, right? Because this can't be an academic exercise, right? Because then you will actually see yourselves some of the resistance you're facing. And then as allies, if we're in certain places of position, power, or even be able to lend a voice, or, or uh, physically, because because there was about a year ago, I'm not sure if, if you know, there was a big uh, a protest going on, and they were, they were saying you're calling it protest. It's not protest. We're just defending, right? So you guys can label it what you want uh, on some couple of rail lines, and it was two and a half hours away, and I drove there, right? Because 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 my head was spinning, and I said I just need to be there. I just physically need to be there. Uh, that's where I'm going to feel most at peace, first of all, and then seeing what the needs are there. Uh, is there anything I can get for you guys? You guys need money right now? Do you guys just need somebody to talk to? Just being there, because that will then also, you know, because sometimes we say, where do we start? What do we do? And sometimes just get, go, move, and you, you'll start figuring some of those pieces out. And and um, so, so yeah, and and you're talking about the the, the John A. and, and uh, Ryerson University um, and the name and stuff. And, and, and you're not going to erase figures from history. The beauty is, are you willing to, 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 and it's not even a star, because I don't want these things as stars on people's bios. It's not like, oh, they're great, but here's a star. I want them to be what we call a more inclusive and accurate portrayal of Sir John and McDonald, right? And so I have no forms of, 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 of having that conversation, right? Because I want people to have a more full and accurate picture of who our first prime minister was. The reference that you're speaking to was a letter that he wrote in 1867. And it was coincidentally the year that we signed the BNA Act in Canada. And so that's where that poster had come up to juxtaposition this person versus who then we had an army led by Sikh, our current defense minister. And, and speaking to that, it didn't necessarily speak to uh, how inclusive he was or what have you. It was speaking to a time and a moment of a letter of what was going on geo with the geopolitics and even asking ourselves, why would he even mention the word Sikhs? How, there's no Twitter, there's no Facebook, where does it come from? So we deconstructed that way as well. But we open up at the museum and we'll speak to those issues at the same time critically. And, and so that's the important difference because you're never gonna erase history, but you wanna start providing a more accurate and inclusive narrative of people, right? And, and not necessarily an asterisk. And, and, um, and so then people will have, when they see, even if there's still a monument related to them, right? Uh, because is it, is it one or the other, or can it be this and? And how do, how do we reconcile those places? And it's not easy. I don't have the perfect answer for that. Nelson Mandela, I think if anybody knows all the challenges he had, because there were people who spent time in jail, they're some of his best friends. In fact, there was his partner and his wife, Winnie, who was in the struggle on the ground while he was in jail. And when they came out, as much as they loved each other still, there were some aspects they just couldn't reconcile around certain things of how to move about and going forward on some pieces, right? Because there's some people say, I'll never ever shake hands with my oppressor, right? And someone else is saying, well, if we wanna move forward, we wanna move forward on our own or together now, because that's what we've been fighting for all this time, right? There's no right or wrong or pure answer to it, but these are the, great questions that we want to have these great conversations like we're having today around, right? To see where do we land? And, and, and the biggest danger I want to share with all of you is accept that sometimes both people can be right. 
not about we can agree to disagree because I disagree with you. No, learn in these spaces to know that we can both be right. And the reason being is the fact that we had to mediate a decision of whether we think a statue should stay and should go this way or remove it and put this there. We both actually can be right. But the fact that we even had to have this discussion is the challenge because what's happened is that will divide us as a community. And so today we spoke, Arjun, you and me, tomorrow we disagree on, on a statue and we're saying we're separating ourselves as Sikhs because of a statue? I don't think that that's what the gurus had in mind. When in Canada, and I'll tell you what's happened here, Sikh Heritage Month gets declared, people think it's great. And I said, it, it's divided our community more than, more than when it came in. And why? It's because it, provincially, when the first event comes up, whosoever party's in power hosts it. They're the ones in power, they host the event. Then the other two want to follow up. And so if, if I attend the first one, and my, when it was the liberals in power, the people who are part of the NDP or conservatives don't show up. And then the other ones don't show up to theirs. And I said, I didn't know Guru Nanak and them had in, uh, defined us as liberal Sikhs, conservative Sikhs, and NDP Sikhs. And we're dividing ourselves. And what is what what is what does the title of a liberal uh, of a political party have to do with you and me and all the critical issues we just talked about earlier in our presentation? Tell me. So be very mindful. That's another lesson for you, young people. I spent my years. People have asked me to go into politics and a lot of other pieces and stuff. And I said, I'm not because it's some of these processes innately divide us more than they bring us together. I've been spending over 30 years of my life mobilizing and keeping the community together. No matter, no matter what titles people put in, whatever labels people want to put on about uh, Amatari, Kes Dari, Sam Dari, Blue Dari, No Dari, this, that, forget all that stuff. You know what I mean? We're on a continuous spectrum of six and where you want on your spiritual journey, we all got work to do, but let's, let's as a collective. And so keep that one in mind because we, we, we go at each other, sometimes even harder. <laughs> <laughs> then, then, then the racism that's against us by society, right? And we can't afford to. We can't afford to. No, hundred percent. And um, if there aren't any more questions, uh, I want to kind of bring everything back to the beginning now. So where we were started talking about sort of sports and then and, and finance strength and and like community. Um, what lessons do you feel that you learned from the sports world that you carried forward into your advocacy, into your historical work, into into all your other sort of into all the other initiatives you've been a part of, we didn't sort of discipline. tie them together. Discipline, discipline, right? So, so, so any any sport that any athlete wants to excel in requires dedication and discipline. Period. I, name any sport and tell me somebody who's not disciplined or dedicated. You know, any athlete, male or female, in any sport. And and that 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 is what and, and then you have to have initiative, you have drive, you have to have competition, you have to know that you're gonna lose and how do you bounce back? So all those kind of lessons, lessons of how to work. So there's individual sports I played, there's there's team sports I played. Uh, how do you mobilize? How do you how do you take the strengths of what everybody has? Because everybody's not at the same level on our soccer team. We're not all uh, 14 players, uh, all all top notch, whatever soccer player you want to name level, right? And people have their different strengths and weaknesses and all that stuff. How do you, that? How do you have a concept of respect of, in, uh, of, of difference, different opinion of what you think you want to do and a coach wants to do something else? So many life lessons, healthy lessons that you can get from sport that can be applied into to life and, and stuff. Um, sport is not immune to racism and everything else. We knew from the Olympics. We knew from Muhammad Ali. We, we know all these things, right? So be naive to think, just let athletes be athletes. You can't. Remember when I said no institution is, no university is, no sport is immune from racism. Never has been, never will be. The uh, English Premier League isn't. N no one is, right? And but but sports has been great for me. Uh, if anybody hasn't had a chance, you can check my website out. It's just my name, Pradeep.ca. And another piece, I would always ask you to do something towards a healthy lifestyle. And the reason being is, as much as these issues and in work and everything else are critical, you wanna have a healthy healthy lifestyle for body, mind, and soul. And so you wanna be uh, active and that allows, for me, it's always allowed me to, to, to have another place for different types of energy to be engaged and also to, for, for, for me to be in, in good spiritual, mental, physical health as well. 
And so, so I'm never going to stop. I've played many different sports. I've been involved differently uh, all the time. Marathons I ran for about 15 years. Um, and it helps you grow and gives you a sense of discipline as well. And, and it's healthy. It's healthy. And, and, and I would really encourage everybody to find just whatever that, that, that physical activity for you to be able to, 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 to uh, help yourself out in all aspects of life. Definitely, no, I hear you. And uh, we have another question here in the chat. So I'm asking, um, do you think that athletes have an obligation or a responsibility to speak on social issues given their platform absolutely, and age? Absolutely. absolutely. When you're making $30 million, when I'm paying $100 something dollars to go and watch a basketball game, and when you get to talk about whatever you want to talk about, and you, and then, and then, and, and, and why, why would I say that an athlete can't speak on social issues, but when Adidas or Nike or some other companies want to pay the money, to endorse the product, they can speak every day. They can tweet about it every day. So come on, you can't you can't technically have both. And then the other piece is, listen, I don't care what role. I don't care if, if you're the prime minister, the president, uh, you're a street sweeper, you're homeless. It doesn't matter your status, your identity, uh, and where you are. If there are any place in the world where we're silent or we can be silent or we think it's not the right place, we're doomed as a society. We're doomed as a society. Okay. Because, because you also can't separate. So, so let's just say a, an athlete, so they're not playing a soccer game and they're in the neighborhood. What do you see them as? Because you actually only knew them as an athlete. That's how you even know their identity. Do they get to separate themselves when they speak? Or they say, I can't speak because I became a professional. I'm making 30 million, so I'm not allowed to speak. Come on, right? So, so, so none of those, and that's part of some of the readings. Dr. Ayu Singh is a phenomenal writer. He, there's a, one of the greatest chapters I've read of one of his little books was religion and politics. What a mix. Cause you know, some people say, don't mix religion and politics. Don't mix uh, sports and race and politics. What are you talking about? Sports is political. Sports is political. We have the concept of Miri Piri and Sikhi. And in fact, Dr. Ayu Singh argue, he says any faith that can't respond to the political climate it's in is a dead religion. You have to be, you have to, right? <laughs> There's politics everywhere. So, so again, how we frame these and speak to these issues would really be important because you remember again, that social capital and the knowledge base of having these types of questions to put those in context. Cause I get a lot of that. All the speaking I've been doing for over 30 years, I get a lot of these types of questions. And then people say, oh, wow, well, thanks for that. Cause now I feel empowered enough cause, cause I have some framework I can speak to somebody if I get challenged, because you know what happens, you get defensive, you don't know when you're into the corner and then, oh my God, right? And, and we want to have an open, broader discussion because th th that's been the spirit of our faith. You know, we, we were open to, to other writers in our scripture, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right? And, there, and that would be another conversation I'd love to have a conversation on just in terms of the Kurugan Saab, uh, the concept of uh, the musicology of it and stuff. It just, oh my God, just too exciting and inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> no, hundred percent. And and there's always something. There's always that one idea that always resonated with me was the idea of the personal is the political, right? And that all our identities are when you have to put them in context of society, they always have a sort of political element to them in terms of the way we engage with one another. And I feel like sports is is really key in that as well. You know, talking about interacting with one another and sort of how how all these dynamics then come into play. Yeah, well, definitely... Muhammad Ali can gold medal for his country. But when he goes back, has to drink from a different water fountain. Come on, how could it not? One hundred percent. Yeah, and if, if there are no more sort of uh, questions in the chat, but I feel that like this is a fantastic note to end our conversation on. I just want to say, again just say thank you so much for joining us and thank you for uh, being here today. And uh, thank you. This is a big, also a big thank you to everyone who came to listen. Uh, this conversation will be uh, recorded and uploaded to our YouTube shortly. Uh, but again, Buddy Baji, thank you so much for your time, and, and it's been a phenomenal talk. I've had a smile on my face the whole time. <laughs> so, and me too, if you notice, and how much yeah, I enjoy this. Pieces. Yeah, and and to all of you, uh, personally and professionally, as you, as you are going to go out into your careers and stuff like that, I'm an email away, a phone call away, um, you know, a flight away. I always joke with people because, because you know, I remember in Vancouver, uh, there was a young a student association, and I said, so what's the issue with me getting to Vancouver? Uh, uh, I don't need to be put up in a hotel or anything. I love sleeping at people's houses. I got enough family and friends anyway, but even if it's someone else, because you get to talk and share stories and 
you know, hang out and stuff. And I said, if it's a $600 ticket, if you guys can't cover the 600, maybe we'll split it $300 each. And if you can't, party works. I can cover 600. I'm, I'm not losing sleep in my life, right? And, and you know, it's a three-hour flight. England, you know, I can, I, one way you gain time, one way you lose time. Seven hours away maximum, you know what I mean? Could fly in and stuff like that. And so never think that we're far apart either, right? We're close enough through contact and, and feel free to contact me ever. Um, and, and if I can ever be of support or help or of use, uh, keep me in mind and thank you for the opportunity and best of luck as you're wrapping up the semester and exams and assignments and everything else. And, and, and I hope that you guys are going to rock the world each, each and every single one of you. Thank you, buddy. Yeah. And, um, also just want to let everyone know as well, we've also just dropped the link to, uh, the Cambridge Core Donuts fundraiser. They look to do some renovations work and you want to plug that every opportunity we get. Uh, but again, to everyone who's turned up today, to Buddy Paji, thank you so much, and and we wish you all the best. Why did you come here, sir? Why you push All of you had to find an excuse to get to Toronto somehow. <laughs> we'll find them. Okay.